Build Aid Media, powered by builders and supported by Mix 93.8 FM and SA Garden and Home, are proud to bring you this homeowner workshop series. Throughout this series, we will be showcasing a wide variety of industry specialists to ensure a positive building experience. In this episode, Patrick Gordon from Grow Adorn Water Technology talks about mixes and taps, the various products available on the market, and their benefits. Your host is Graham Alexander from Build Aid Media. Patrick, thanks for, for being with us. Pleasure. Getting water into these um, bathroom wear, toilets and so on, one is sometimes a challenge and one can be aesthetically beautiful um, the way you do it. I think the drainage was never intended to be beautiful, except perhaps on a slipper bath, you've got to deal with it um, somewhere. So let's start with, with, with some baths, if, if we can, Patrick, and how we get water um, into and out of those vessels. Uh, traditionally, we'd have the old built-in bath and so forth where everything was hidden, so your drainage was completely out of sight. But to get the water in, we would normally, in the olden days, they had the two pillar taps. Nowadays, they're getting more modern to expose bath mixes and even to single lever mixes. And if you have a look on the slide there on the left hand side, there's a little thing we call a Nikki spout, which has got a dual purpose. So it fills the bath and it also works as an overflow. So if you get into the bath and the water level rises a little bit high, then the water can overflow through there. Uh, but also the filler goes through there. So it's nice and neat and out of the way. As you said just now, when you're getting in and out of a bath, you keep on bumping yourself, you end up with bruises, with something like that, it's totally out of the way. There we have on the right hand side a yeah. lever, so that's all you would see and in the Nikki spout the water is, get, is entering the bath through what would also be the overflow. Correct, so you yes. don't have what's on the left there which is a spout. Spout sticking out, yeah. And quite often people end up putting the taps in the wrong place. You end up having to lean over the bath to get to the taps and so forth. So, to stick it where you can get to it much easier than having to reach over everything. And then you'll see the, the plain filler spout there also on the picture, which is the old traditional way of filling the yeah. bath. Um, and if I look at the one on the left there, um, Patrick, you, you obviously guys still sell that kind of stuff, but I would consider that quite old fashioned. It's old fashioned, yes, but very popular still. Style-wise, as you said, it's very outdated. But it's nice also where you've had a bath before and never had a shower. Now with everybody trying to save water, you're starting to shower more instead of bathing. So you could unscrew your old spout, put something like that on, and have a hand shower available at the same time without changing all your plumbing and so forth. So yes, I think that's one of the reasons why it is still popular because it gives you that little bit of flexibility in the installation. Start getting water out of a bath. Um, the, the, the hole with the plug in it is referred to as a waste. And sometimes we've got to be aware of where that waste is because it might be on either end, it could be in the middle or it could be offset on, on one side. And you guys at um, Grower Dawn, you're not only making uh, mixes and taps, but you're also making waste and the bits and pieces um, that get the yeah. drainage or the water out of a system. Yeah. On that first slide where we had the uh, freestanding bath, it showed an interesting one where you actually have a pop-up, so you don't have the old plug and chain either. So you have almost like a Nikki spout, which allows the water, and you can see it in that middle section of the picture, where you can have the water filling in, the overflow, and if you turn the knob, it actually pops the, the waste up and down. So technology is getting so that everything is hidden out the way. You don't want to now, after you've bathed, dig in this dirty water to get the plug out. All you do is turn the button and your bath empties out. So there's some very nice ways of doing it these days. Let's have a look at how we connect toilets. Now, there's not much one can do with regard to mixes and so on. There's a, a fairly technical um, graphic that's come up on the on the screen but obviously we're getting water into it and we've got to get water 
out of it, but how pretty can we get that pipe going up there into the system? Yes, that's a very basic way of doing it with a flexible connector. There are connectors available, which is a soft-drawn copper tubing, but it's been chrome-plated. So you can bend it fairly easily to where you want, but it looks a bit nicer than this stainless steel braided item. Um, so, yeah, it's not a hang of a lot, as you say, that you can do with that. And this kind of thing can let you down. You've thought about everything in your bathroom. You've got it all right. And the toilet comes and you go, what's that? Um, we need to know about these bits and pieces. Um, the other thing on that, on that pan, um, Patrick, from a plumbing point of view, and, and, that's, at, and that's your world as, as, as well as um, fittings, is a 110 millimeter pipe that needs to, and it can either go down into the, in, into the slab or into the floor, or it can go through a trap out, uh, straight out of the wall. These are things that the architect will know about getting the water up. But if you're doing an alteration and you want to move that where you used to have the loo to over here, you need to consider these, um, consider these things. On to showers, um, uh, Patrick. Shower heads, or sometimes referred to as a shower rose, is there a standard height or is it a bit of sort of hit and miss? The average standard is 2.1 meters. But... If you have a look at that shower on the right hand side up at the top, so if you come out of the wall at 2.1 but now it drops down, then you've got this big shower rose underneath and you and I can't stand underneath that shower rose. So sometimes, yes, you've got to keep it in mind when you're speaking to the architect, the dimensions of the people that are going to be using it. Um, there are also other ways of doing it where they actually come from the ceiling down. So you'd have a bulkhead uh, dropping the shower rose or a bulkhead where the shower rose exactly fits into it so you don't even see the shower arm at all anymore. But in, in general, a, a good uh, height for the finishing of the bottom of the shower rose is about 2.1 meters. I went to an exhibition in Paris some years ago and one of the exhibition halls, which was pretty much the size of, of Nazareth, was only showers. And there's different jets coming in horizontally, vertically. So showers can obviously get very sophisticated. It's not just about taps and a shower, a shower head. I mean, there are tap uh, well, shower units that we do now, which is your steam generator in with it. You've got, as you say, side body sprays. You've got different options of shower roses up at the top. And then you include a bit of sound and lighting and so forth in it, giving you mood lighting. So, yes, as you say. Uh, and a waterproof cell phone. It's something like that, yeah. <laughs> um, the, w the way we can control the water in a shower could be just two stop valves like we have um, on the left or a, or a single lever. Yeah. You may even on a shower, a lot of people these days want an overhead shower and a hand shower. So then you'd put a normal diverter bath mixer in. So you'd have a mixer like that, but it would have a little button above it. So when you open the water, it would be an overhead shower. But if you wanted to use a hand shower, then you just push the diverter button and it goes over to the hand shower. I know quite often the plumbers get it mixed up. And when you open it, all of a sudden the hand shower starts. So they must just make sure they get the primary and the secondaries right. <laughs> Otherwise, you may get a surprise. But yes, there's a whole lot of different options. You could even have it where you open up and it's an overhead. And if you want body sprays, then you push the diverter. And all of a sudden, the body sprays come in from the side. So we've got to think out of the box. There's almost unlimited what you can do to achieve your own likes and dislikes. Patrick, help us out before we talk about ba basins. Which side is the cold and which side's the hot? Okay, hot is supposed to be always left, and on the right is the cold. And a lot of people say, so what does it matter? You know, I've got that little indice. But if you can imagine showering, for instance, now you've got your hair and your eyes full of soap, and you want to change the temperature. If you turn the wrong one, you're in for a big surprise. Yeah. <laughs> Also, if you put yourself in the shoes of a blind person, he now comes to a basin which is hot and which is cold. So if there's a standard convention stuck to like hot left, cold right, 
everybody knows exactly what's happening yeah. at that basin. If you're using a countertop basin, Patrick, you're gonna, you, there are a number of ways you can get water into that basin. One of them, I think, is unlikely that the fitting is attached to the basin. It's either going to come out of the countertop or, or out of the wall. Yeah, well, similar to what you've got there, it would have a long high-rise body so that you can actually clear the spout to the side of the basin or you could have your spout coming out of the wall and throwing the water in. There's some very nice ones which almost looks like a waterfall uh, spout throwing it into the basin. Um, that's a single it's lever on a wall-mounted basin. Yes, yeah, so th that one you'd actually have to specify the basin. Do you want it single tap hole or double tap hole? Quite often now basins come pre-punched so they don't have any tap holes in. You actually, the plumber taps it in what he wants. So this would be a single tap hole uh, and traditionally that would be in the center of the basin. But if you want to go unconventional, maybe a his and a hers, you could have the two taps more to the one side, closer together and the basin off. It's, it's fairly flexible again. So if you had, that's a three tap hole. Three tap hole. So you'd have on your left hand side your hot, right hand side cold. It blends underneath the basin in a system of pipes and come out in a central spout. Okay. And, and that would be your wall mounted two under tile stop taps and then coming out in a single outlet. And could that be a single lever mixer with a spout? It could very yeah. well be, yes. You get some which it's all in one unit, so you get a big square face plate with the single lever on the one side and a spout coming out of it or you could make up your own mixture. Okay. And that's sort of an array. I think what's important on that slide, we, that in the next to the writing basins, you've got that tall single lever mixer, and then the one below it is, is obviously for a drop-in basin, because it's yeah. not as tall. Yeah. So you would have all different ones like that, as you say, your three tap hole basin mixers. Uh, you'll see some of them have got two handles, some of them have got one handle. The single lever one, obviously, uh, the name tells you what it is. It's a single lever that operates your flow and gives you your blend from hot to cold. And the others with the two separate levers we normally call a screw down tap because it's the same as when you're screwing a screw into a piece of wood. You've got to turn it a couple of times to go in. And uh, then on the top right hand, you'll see one there that is a quarter turn tap. So it looks like a screw down, but you don't have to turn it a lot. And that's very nice for people that suffer with arthritis or have got some immobility. So it's very much easier to turn that tap on and off. Okay. When it comes to safety, Patrick, and safety I think predominantly is, is boiling water, hot water. Um, before we chat about that, what, what temperatures should a geyser be set at? Okay, it should be at least 60, so between 60 and 65. And the reason for that is Legionella that can grow in the pipework system. Now Legionella can survive up to 58 degrees Celsius, so we don't want Legionella. Anybody that knows about Legionella, you get flu-like symptoms, you go to the doctor, you get treated, and before you get better, you get dead. Okay, so we don't want that. <laughs> So at 60, it kills all that uh, Legionella bacteria and you get a little bit of a temperature drop between the geyser and the terminal fitting, which will be your tap or the outlet. And in general, you then get water at about 58 degrees coming out of the hot water tap. So, so that sort of uh, um, sets the standard up front. But how do tap fittings deal with safety as a device? A normal mixer like that, there is no real safety in, except that you've got to physically move it from left to right to change the temperature. But in a shower, for instance, where you could bump it while you're turning, you could all of a sudden knock it to the hot water side. There, it's very nice to have a thermostatic mixer. So you could set it, leave it. It's got a safety override of 38 degrees Celsius normally. So you can't accidentally turn it all the way up. 38 to, 38 to 42 is an average showering temperature. So 38 would yeah. 
be safe. But for basin mixers, you do get cartridges which has got a limiting ring. So you actually take the handle off, set the limiting ring, which stops the hot water from going all the way to the hot side. So while you've got hot and cold water running, there will always be blend. You can't push it all the way to the hot. And that's nice, especially when you have children in the house so they don't accidentally push it over and burn themselves. But yes, thermostatic mixers, electronic mixers, which will have a pre-blender maybe, so you can't accidentally burn yourself. Particularly in a shower, I'm sure everyone's experienced it somewhere when you've got a single lever shower mix and you bump it mm. by mistake um, onto hot, can be uncomfortable. Um, electronic mixes and, and taps, I assume you need to get electricity there, so there's a different installation. Yeah, that always throws up the the question is, who does the installation of your tap now? Is it, do you call an electrician or a plumber to do the job? But most of your electronic taps works on low voltage, normally a 9 or a 12 volts, so the plumber still does the installation. And in general, it'll either be into a cupboard or a false duct or something like that, where all the wires and the piping are hidden away, and you just have a sensor like that one in the middle, or it could be on the tap on the right hand side where you see the little infrared sensor in the front and the solenoid valve will all be at the bottom hidden in the cupboard again. So yes, you do have electricity but it's all low voltage and very safe. There's just a couple of things that we mustn't forget. When we're going into designing and building our homes, just a couple of pointers. Um, one, it's not difficult. Don't let anybody confuse you that the science of building is... Diff if you have a professional, you take your time, you use people like us, it's a lot of fun. And you can build to budget. We're busy with contracts all the time. We get it spot on. A couple of things on that list there. Budget realistically. If you're going to start, you can't build a five-bedroom home for two million rand. You need some kind of a realistic budget, otherwise you're in for a surprise. Don't take advice from your butcher and your doctor and your chemist. They don't know anything. That's bad advice. They're just giving you some of their experience. Experience is not good advice. Employ the right architect to provide a complete service. Get involved. Get involved. Understand what people are doing. It's your project. Use technology. Technology like modeling, 3D modeling, BIM building information modeling, use specialists, people like this. They're out there, most manufacturers, not most, all of them. You'll be amazed what they'll do for free in helping you put this design together. Clever architects use them all the time. Calculate the building costs accurately. Go to a company like BuildAid um, or a quantity surveyor. Give them your drawings. They'll work it out down to the last nail and the last liter of paint before you start building. Once you started building, it's probably too late. Employ the right contractor. One of my favorite clients, um, unfortunately passed away. He was the head of West Bank and, and we designed his lodge and ended up doing a whole lot of other houses for him. And he said the most important thing, because he was running a bank, was the contractor. He said above everybody else, it's the contractor because you're gonna spend six months with this guy and you're gonna trust him and you don't want to mess. Get the right contractor and then use a contract and get everything in writing. Don't just agree to things, put everything in writing. Thank you very much for listening and thank you very much to my guests. Thank you for joining us. If you would like to watch any more of the workshops in the Homeowner Series, follow the BuildAid YouTube channel or visit our website, buildaid.co.za, where you can find a full range of our product offering. To book your seat at our next workshop, visit caxtonevents.co.za. Don't forget to tune into Mix 93.8 FM Wednesday evenings from 6pm to 7pm to listen to the Bull Day Show.